honor to um, introduce our speaker to you to talk about the Big Quad at the NIH Library. Um, this is James Kane. He's the branch chief and information architect at the NIH Library. Um, he spent the last several years blending his IT background with librarianship to enhance services and meet the changing needs of the largest medical research agency in the world. James leads the custom information services effort, which is focused on building partnerships to meet the information needs of researchers through the application of information tools. Um, previously to this, James spent 18 years at the Naval Research Laboratory Jesuit Library. Uh, James is very active in the Special Libraries Association. Uh, his master's degree in library and information science is from Catholic University, and he also has a bachelor's of computer graphics from Salem International University. And next week, James will be recognized as federal librarian of the year. I'm really looking forward. <laughs> I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing James's approach to managing change at NIH, and especially how he is scaling a portfolio of custom services. So give me James a hand. Thank you. I'm going to wander a little bit with the, the space here in the lobby, so I'll see what I can do. But thank you for coming to the session and for giving me a few minutes to talk about the awesome work that gets done at the NIH Library through the Informationist Program and through the Geek Squad. And if you can tell, I'm my copyright, the copyright librarian at the library got a hold of these slides, so give credit where credit's due. So first, um, we are the, the National Institute of Health is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. NIH is plural, so it's made up of 27 institutes and centers. Each one acts like individual agencies or individual CATs. Um, we're primarily based in Bethesda, Maryland, but we have four major locations across the country. We're the principal funder of biomedical research to the tune of $32 billion a year. 80% of that goes out to academia to fund research. 10% stays in-house for intramural research, and 10% covers everything else, the building, the library, so um, The intramural research program is 1,200 principal investigators and 4,000 postdoctoral fellows. The library, the NIH library, has 48 federal employees and a dozen contract staff. We are organized in a matrix organization, which means that even though we have three uh, branches, and one of the branch chiefs, uh, most of the work is done through teams. To foster innovation and to stay nimble, we form those teams with members from across all of the different branches and offices, and those teams are focused on strategic and operational issues and are formed each year. Uh, at NIH, we focus on meeting the needs of those that work at NIH, the intramural research community, as well as the grant managers who govern that 8% of the, the budget. In addition, we also serve as virtual library for a number of other agencies within HHS, including the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services at the Baltimore, the Indian Health Service, which is a nationwide um, organization, uh, SAMHSA, which is uh, mental health, uh, HRSA, HRQ, and a number of other other acronyms. Uh, we collaborate extensively with the FDA library as well as the CDC library, and especially on collaborative purchases of drones. We are often confused with NLM, the great organization that also happens to live on the same campus as us. Much larger organization, two big buildings full of wonderful people. We collaborate with them on a number of things like shared licenses and some digital repository efforts and so forth. Uh, as well as hosting and the NIH Associate Fellow. But we are the internal library, so we're like the research library for NIH. NLM is the national library for health. So. so as context, I need to explain the informationist program. So a key component of the NIH library, and, and to give you an idea of that 48 federal employees, 15 of them are informationists. So this is a personalized service delivered um, how we personalize and bring down this vast collection of resources. We provide desktop access to 10,000 journals, hundreds of databases. Um, I think our statistic is we, we NIH, download 20,000 articles a day on average. 
So we, we are voracious in our appetite. And the 10,000 journals are all individual titles. So I, I manage the subscriptions uh, for the library as well. And all of them are individual. So there could be bundled big deals like Elsevier, Library, and so forth. But we're not counting in that 10,000 you know, aggregator databases and stuff, those, those kind of things. Uh, so the information is program started in 2001 as one of the first in the country to merge scientific excellence with professional librarianship in order to move pre more precisely respond to and anticipate our customers' needs. So that has grown over the years to now include 16 informationists with working within 50 groups at 20 institute and centers, as well as 17 HHS staff and operational divisions. So a component of that, in support of the information program, the NIH library created a custom information solution service several years ago. So simply put, our job is to be the deep squad to the librarians and the informationists who work closely with those research or clinical teams at NIH. So when those groups discover as part of their embedded nature, so they're, they're, they're specialized, and that's why I should back up and explain a little bit more, um, an informationist can be a, a clinician or chemist or endocrinologist, and they take that expertise that they have in addition to their librarianship, and they work in research groups. So they're truly embedded, they're working as part of a research team. They're not a liaison in the sense that they're covering the entire National Cancer Institute. We do have those relationships as well, but a truly embedded role is one where you're part of and accepted as a member of the research team that's working on a specific project. So it could be a fixed length project uh, on a specific objective. Um, at times, those groups will come back and they come back to the library because uh, they're spending 75% of the time with the research groups and then 25% back to the library. Um, and they'll come back and they'll work with me and my team and say that you know, this group that we're working with, they really have a, uh, an issue that requires a technology solution. And I'll give some examples as we go into this. Um, so that's where we come in and help. They're, they're, I, by no means, me and my team, by no means pretend to be medical librarians. We, we are more geek librarians. So we bring the technology expertise in while they can speak the, the the chemistry language and you know those kind of things. Since we offer, my team offer both expertise in information organization, information architecture, as well as information technology, we can deliver more targeted solutions than a typical IT department. You know, as a, a computer geek, I think you say, most IT people will, if you know, they, they can deliver a website, they can build a server and so forth. What we're trying to do as a team is we're trying to bridge the gap and bring together librarianship, information organization, information architecture, as well as technology and marry those two together and deliver targeted solutions. So our group does not create basic web pages. We, we avoid those kind of things because you can go to any contractor, you can go anywhere and get those kind of things. We're looking at more specialized solutions. As part of our job, we have to work closely with the IT departments in all of those different institutes in which we're, we're working to coordinate so that to make sure that our solution eventually fits into their environment or something that they can support. Um, that they have the option of either taking taking the project and then hosting it and then them running it after it's developed or uh, having us continue to maintain the project over time. So our services fall into five areas. In the screen first is API support. We, you know, the library buys lots of stuff. We buy from Elsevier and Thompson Reuters and so forth. And as part of those contractual relationships, we have a natural entree and expertise into understanding how to get access to the data that's within those systems. So the Thompson Reuters and Elsevier are two big ones where they have lots of APIs or application programming interfaces so that you can get side door access into the information. I'll talk a little bit more in a second. Um, the second thing is uh, virtual research environments. So these are virtual or web-based communities. Uh, the third area is web-based research portfolio sites. Fourth, digitization. And lastly, technology community building. So the first one is APIs or application programming interfaces. So think of it as when you go to a website, so the Web of Science or Scopus, you're using the front door. This front door is optimized for human consumption. It, it's got a user interface and places to click on, places for you to read and so forth. 
it's not optimized for machine consumption. So if a server or a piece of programming wants to be able to access that code, there's old fashioned techniques where you can do screen scraping and trying to figure out, well, where's the button to say go no, and where are the fields to put in information and then get back results. It's, more, it's better if you can optimize it so that you push a structured message to the server saying, I want X. And then it gives it back to the machine in a structured way. That's simply an API. We want to bring together and have brought together a site to bring it up to show web of science, Scopus, um, PubMed, other resources that are, are commonly used at NIH so that people could, or the technology people in those different institutes, could build subsystems and be able to easily access that information. A lot of the information is freely available, some of it will cost money. Um, since we already have those relationships with those vendors, if an organization says, I want to get all of the um, papers that were funded, that were created as a result of grant funding from my institute, they could go to Web Science or Scopus and do the searches and then try to download them 500 at a time and you know, so forth. Or they could use the create an API to download them in larger batches and set up a routine to be able to download that all. Or the third approach is we can go to the company and say we want all of the records based on this criteria. They'll give us a price and then they'll give us a batch download of all the records that we need. So we're trying to help in, in this regard of uh, uh, helping to give people access to the raw data that they can't easily get through the human interface. Um, we are planning to expand shortly to include a lot of the systems that are already at NIH. So NIH Reporter, um, uh, Impact2, which is a funding database, and so there's lots of systems that are at NIH that have interfaces or have ways to get at the information. NIH is a large organization. There's lots of systems. People don't necessarily know the best place to go, and they also don't necessarily know how the systems are interconnected and interplay. So we're trying to document that information and put that up as well for people to be able to consume and use. I mentioned virtual uh, research environments. So um, my example project is PETA, or the Pandemic Influenza Digital Archive. So NIAD, or National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, reached out to us, the library, after they worked with a contractor and the project didn't go so well. They, they weren't happy with the results. Um, so then they turned to us and said, well, could you do this? Could you do something like this? It started off really as um, the researcher had been collecting original papers on pandemic influenza, primarily focused on the 1918 pandemic. PubMed goes back to 1948 right now. So it doesn't cover the 1918 pandemic, not you know, the original literature that was published at the time. So there's a gap there. And this researcher working at Allergy and Infectious Diseases is focused on pandemic influenza because they're trying to do research on the history of influenza so they can figure out how to deal with influenza today. You know, the, the, their big goals of creating a universal vaccine so you don't have to create a different one each season. Um, but also how, how to address a pandemic. It's, just, it, it's, it's a matter of when, when, when that's going to come. Some, it's going to happen again sometime. Um, they had collected 5,000 different publications back to 800 AD in 17 different languages. Some of them complete books, others articles. You can imagine that span of time. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of variety of stuff. So the original goal of the project was to basically catalog and digitize. But then the Custom Solutions Group came in and said, you know, we're starting to play with this new thing called Drupal, our open source content management system. Let's see what we can do with it. So in two weeks, we stood up a server, created a, a website, and started playing with it, and showed it to the customer. And I said, we love it. We want to, we want to go this way. So that started a big effort, multi-year effort, to move towards this, what we have right now, which is a draft of data site of pandemic influenza. So we've digitized, let's see, things about, we digitized all 5,000 publications, now we're in the process of indexing all of them. We're doing not only basic indexing, you know, general edition pages, that kind of stuff, 
but we're also indexing coexisting diseases, we're geotagging the publications, we're listing what pandemic or um, ep um, epidemic are described in the paper, um, the dates of the uh, described in the paper. So we're really trying to pull out as much information as we possible as possible into the system. We have faceted displays. Uh, we can also map, put the stuff onto a map. We can show a bar chart or a timeline with the goals so that when you're digging through this collection, you'll be able to see and visualize where, where things are. And, and our broader goal with this project is to put out a system that this niche community around the world, historic cannabis influenza, influenza researchers, would be able to interact and start to do things with it and cluster the information here in ways that they haven't been able to do before. Um, by creating custom collections, they're able to, to go through this entire collection and break it into subsets so we can see these are papers about the 1888 pandemic, or these are papers related to um, swine flu or, or, or um, avian flu. Um, so lots of different ways that, that we'll be able to uh, do this. And just uh, the, the variety of languages and you know, going back to 1888, the you know, bibliographic control is far different than it is today. So it's been a fun project, um, and we're looking forward to releasing it later this year. So the next project, type of project, is portfolio research. And this, again, came started because the National Institute on Aging came to the library. Um, they heard about some of the other stuff that we were doing, and they said, we have this spreadsheet. It's got 6,000 records of 6,000 lines of funding information. And they have been working with Alzheimer's Association, and they created a taxonomy to describe the research, all the aspects of, of Alzheimer's research, from diagnosis through treatment, then drug development, then you know, down to specifics of, of tau and understanding tau and so forth. Um, and what they wanted to be able to do is put a website up, partially because Congress said they, they, they need to do a better job of uh, addressing Alzheimer's and, and figuring out where the money is going and so forth. So we worked with them. We did uh, a lot of different things. We're bringing in different players and partners and so forth to help them to understand what portfolio research, portfolio analysis was. Um, they bought on to that whole concept and then uh, worked with us to build a website. And this website is now available, so it's government. So we have our acronym, so it's IADRP or IDRA, which is International Alzheimer's Disease Research Portfolio. This now has 12,000 records. It includes research from around the world, government and non-government, US, Canadian, British, all over the place. Uh, and just continues to grow. Um, they can do the quick search. So CADRO is that common uh, taxonomy. You'll be able to search by that. You can find out what research a particular PI has got or what organization at the University of Arizona has gotten all kinds of research. You can search for that in here. Um, and you can even visualize. We can make some bar charts and pie charts and stuff so you can see where's the money going. This, this is continuing to grow. And in fact, this has resulted in some additional projects. The newest one that we don't have to today um, is called Altsped. So this is Alzheimer's Preclinical Efficacy Database. So this is going further up the chain and not only looking at where's the funding, but where's the research happening? So the, they want to look at preclinical studies. And we have clinical trials back up, but we don't have anything for preclinical trials. So we are now starting to build a preclinical trials specifically for Alzheimer's, but a way to capture those preclinical studies and they will bring it into one place. Um, lots of descriptive information. Um, we hired a curator who's a librarian, a medical librarian, who's very well versed in all this, and her full-time job is building this database um, for the National Institute of Aging. So that's been a huge thing that we've been working on lately. Uh, under digitization, we've been, you know, many people have been doing digitization for years. Um, I started doing digitization back in the 90s um, when I was with the Navy. And so it's not like, you know, this is new cutting edge technology or anything. But what has been fascinating is that it, it's gotten operational now. 
So I'm working with FedLink. So uh, underneath the Library of Congress, FedLink, FedLink has a contract partnership with um, Internet Archive, and they, they have a service called FedScan. And FedScan is open to any federal agency. Uh, we'll basically for 10 cents a page, 10 cents a page image, you can scan pretty much anything and make it publicly available. And it's hosted on the Internet Archive site. So as you can imagine, the other Internet Archive digitization locations have similar arrangement. They have scanning centers across the country. But this is an example of uh, our work with the CMS Library, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, are located up in Baltimore. Um, so they are the people that manage Medicare, Medicaid, as you know, the Child Health Insurance Program. And they had approached the library about wanting to work more closely together uh, and helping out their library. They have a small two-person library at the time, and they first wanted help with digitizing. They have a lot of unique government-produced material uh, that they wanted to see if they could digitize. And the wonderful thing about government material is there's no copyright. We're not allowed to have copyright. My slides today, I'm a government employee. I made this on government time, so I don't get copyright with it. There's, there's no copyright allowed. Um, CMS publications, reports that are created by CMS, reports, uh, publications like Medicare and Me and those kind of annual things that come out, those, there's no copyright associated with them. So we were able to send them off to FedScan and have them digitized. And you can see them on the right hand side. We digitized over 6,000 items um, within a year and a half. And the limiting factor was our time to pull the stuff off the shelf, put them in the boxes, ship the boxes out, coordinate getting the boxes back, and, and so forth. It was very cost effective, a uh, great project, and um, has really opened up the collection. And what I'm excited about is this year is the, the beginning of the celebrations of the Great Society. And one of the components of the Great Society legislation is Medicare. So we're really trying to wrap this up and button this up in time for it so that this can be slipped in as part of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Medicare. Okay, so the last area, uh, I originally called this advocacy, but then that didn't sound right coming from government. So um, community building. I think libraries are really well positioned to advocate for solutions that make sense for our customers. You know, I think ideally we should understand the, the broader environment, but also understand our customer environment and see where there's potential opportunities for match. So this model has been used in many of our services, including our bibliometrics, bioinformatics, data services, and portfolio analysis. My group has seen growing potential for the use of mobile technologies in government, it's slow, but we're slowly moving away from BlackBerry. And when you move away from BlackBerry onto the Androids or iPhones and so forth, you change how you you change your mobile experience. It goes from simply checking your email anyplace to really surfing the web and being in the cloud. Um, so we're trying to encourage that and help people understand what that you know, the, the opportunities there and the benefits of, of making that switch. Because uh, it can be hard to get the justifications in place to buy the new devices and so forth. Uh, but also with Drupal. Most of the projects that I've been talking about were Drupal related. I learned Drupal on the job uh, five years ago, over, over the, this period of time. Um, and I think it's a great platform. That and WordPress and SharePoint are probably the big ones that, that you know, most people look at. Um, the NIH library's website is currently using SharePoint. And we're now in the process of finally convincing enough people that we're moving the library's website over to Drupal. Um, so with our, with our growing experience uh, and with a growing community of people across NIH, we started hosting the Drupal Government Conference. So this is a, um, a, local, a locally focused event because obviously in DC there's lots of government customers, um, lots of government employees and organizations and agencies that um, are using or exploring Drupal. When the White House switched their, the White House Archive website over to Drupal, that really opened up the door and gave implicit support and endorsement of Drupal. So a lot of organizations have started making that switch. So we got into that fray to help 
people understand what Drupal is and what it can do. So we've done that in a couple of ways. We um, hold a user group meeting in the library quarterly where we bring in speakers, uh, either contractors or other agencies or even within NIH uh, to talk about what their experiences are with Drupal. Um, the area that we're trying to build is uh, developing our own website and an internal space to share. We want uh, people to be able to share what modules they're using, to be able to share themes that they may have had developed with a contractor that they could share with other other institutes within the NIH. Um, or if they've developed custom code, you know, bringing that together so that others can share and learn from it. So we're really trying to build that, that community learning. Um, and then lastly, we're holding the conference. So this conference is being held in July. It's being held on NIH. We're fortunate that we have a, a space that's set up for conferences with a, with a uh, auditorium and breakout rooms and so forth. And it doesn't cost anything if I reserve it. So we've done this for the last couple of years. This year, we're really excited because Mr. Drupal himself, Dries Boutard, um, the founder, uh, the, the chief technology officer and the founder of the Drupal Code is coming to be a keynote speaker for this. It's a free conference. It's three days. There's free food with it. It, it. It's been incredibly popular. Last year we had 500 attendees. This coming year we're expecting 800 attendees. So it, it, we're just really excited about, the, about its growth and potential. And it's getting the word out about what Drupal can do. So another part of uh, advocacy uh, took a reverse. So in 2013, we, we were faced with an opportunity. You know, sometimes you can call it an opportunity, we'll call it opportunity. Um, we decided to move, so we've been doing some renovations in the library over time. And the last print collection that was on the main floor was a reference collection. We moved that downstairs, we did it, we did it, freed up the space, and we had this big hole right in the main area, right near the front door. So we were challenged, so what do we do with the space? Um, so we developed the library, developed the technology sandbox. And this was a way to connect our customers with cutting edge technology to help identify ways that, that may relate to or support the work of research at NIH. So this included purchasing hardware and software as well as uh, showcasing NIH developed tools and So I mentioned that NIH is made up of 27 institutes, but we are in the umbrella part of the organization. So instead of NIAD developing something and then trying to convince the other institutes to come along or partner with them or pay something, we're part of the umbrella. So um, we have somewhat of an advantage in that space um, to bring together different players without it seeming like it's a few, one group. Um, and then lastly, we, it was an opportunity for us to offer technology as a service. So we saw this, as I you know, talked about with Drupal, the, you know, making people aware of technology or solutions or services that they may not be aware of and, and that could have an impact on their work. So there are three zones in this new technology sandbox. So the first is the information zone. So we rebuilt and moved and restructured our information desk. So we, years ago, we combined the reference desk and information desk into one desk, and then we reshaped that again with this. So that's the information zone. Uh, secondly is the collaboration zone, which you see on the screen. So it's made up of two pods. Um, oh, which uh, have two flat screens built in with computers and it's specifically set up by three people collaborating. There's all people kind of collaborating in the reading room already. So this gives them a little bit more privacy, plus it gives them a computer or a screen that they can hook into. Those two computers are loaded up with specialized software. Um, one side is a GIS type software, so for mapping type application. Uh, the second is more uh, 3D modeling and that will get into the storefront. So in the storefront, the first thing that we put in there is 3D printing. So the storefront is set up to highlight some new technologies either that we bring in for people to evaluate or that have been developed across NIH that we want to showcase. So if you're here in the last session, you heard about 3D printing, so we've been playing with 3D printing as well. 
Uh, we did a six month pilot last year, and the goal was to see what's the interest level in 3D printing. But this was designed as a space where people could come in, try it out, see if it worked for them. It's no, by no means meant as a, a production shop. Uh, it's really meant for experimentation. Um, so we bought a MakerBot, um, and then eventually bought a second MakerBot. And we, in order to use the device, in order to use the 3D printer to do a print, you had to come to a training session, a 30 minute training session, and fill out an evaluation form because this was an experiment. And we weren't really sure what we were gonna do at the end of it, so we needed information. Over time, we ended up with three uh, 3D printers. Uh, let's see. So the differences are the, uh, the first one uh, it has a single extruder, so basically one stream of fishing wire-like substance uh, that goes in and then you can print out and, and it, it creates it. So if you aren't familiar with 3D printer, imagine a hot glue gun on a set of robotics that moves around and rapidly melts something, drops it onto a, a platter, that platter rises and lowers, and then you can just you keep doing that and then eventually you build something. So it's an additive type technology. Um, the middle one has two extruders, so that means you can either print faster or you can print two color models. And then the last one was Airwolf, uh, which we were trying had could support more materials, had two extruders, and was supposed to be a newer generation of stuff. We were, I think, one of the first to buy this model, Airwolf, and unfortunately, we've never really gotten it working correctly, yeah. It, but it looks really cool, it's got the blue lights. <laughs> but so far, um, during that six month trial, we printed over 130 successful models and provided 30 minute orientations to over 200 people. Now here's the, uh, the good, the bad, here are some examples. So first, one approach that people were using with the 3D printing was rapid prototyping, seeing if they could create something custom and whether that could work in their environment um, or, or one-off printing. So one uh, simple example is that you can find on the internet a, a thing that you can 3D print, you can slide an iPhone into, and then you can attach that to a microscope. So you, instead of buying an expensive microscope camera, you can just use your iPhone. So that's one way you can do 3D printing. These are some other examples. Um, another, you know, we're biomedical, organization, so there are lots of proteins that were printed out. Um, there were examples of people being able to understand how to combat a disease by seeing the disease cells and see how they interacted by physically looking at them. There's, there's just something different about being able to interact physically versus looking at something in two dimensions. And then this is what it looks like. So on the left is when it comes off the 3D printer, so it's lots of little support beams and so forth that, that we can break off. And then there's also a bath that you can put it through that kind of melts away a little bit of the edges to smooth things off and everything. So that's what the model can look like before and after. And then I also stress that there were 130 successful. I don't think we counted the unsuccessful, but here's an example of uh, some of those unsuccessful. Um, some, sometimes things don't print. Um, the filament can get stuck, or as was mentioned earlier, the, the, the little teeth can break off, um, or it's not, or the platter's not hot enough so it doesn't stick, or there's just lots of, of different types of things that, that can go wrong. Um, I also mentioned that models take a long time. Um, models on averages were, were, I'd say, six to 10 hours to print. Some of them, we, we'd start them and then let them run the entire weekend. It, it, it's a commitment to do the 3D print. Um, but I also wanted to say that um, partnerships were key with, with this. So NIH, as I said, is a large organization. Uh, there were already lots of people that were doing types, different types of things. I mean, there, was, there was one group that had fabrication labs and um, had laser cutters and woodworking shops and all that sort of stuff. So they had you know one realm of expertise with this. Um, there were other groups that were doing some stuff. So what we were striving to do, we're not trying to be the be all end all, what we're trying to be is collaborative. So we were finding all those different groups, bringing them all together and trying to share each other's expertise 
Um, and through this, we have started being able to, as people come in to us, if they want to experiment with our stuff, you know, we can go so far. And then if they wanted to do production, like they found this great model and then they're going off to a conference and they want to hand out 20 copies or something, there's other groups within NIH that they could potentially work with, buy the filament and then be able to, to get it, get a production run printed. Um, but also across the street from us, if you've never been to NIH, we've got three hospitals in, in a short area. So NIH, the clinical center of the building I work in, is one hospital. That's where most of the clinical trials happen. And then to the left is a community hospital. And then to the right is the uh, Naval Hospital, now Walter Reed Hospital, um, where the president goes when he gets sick. So. so there's lots of medical stuff in our area. Over at Walter Reed, they're doing some fascinating work with 3D printers. They've got a big 3D printer. They've got a million dollar printer that prints titanium, so it actually melts titanium, 3D prints titanium for wounded warriors. So it can scan a limb and figure out what, what specialized appendage they need for a particular task that they're doing, and they're able to go in and get it printed and, and be able to walk out with something specialized for, for their need. Um, the other thing that I think is cool in 3D printing is um, artificial limbs for kids wasn't cost effective because kids grow, so it doesn't fit for a period of time. And then if you bought clothes for kids, you know, it may last a season. So buying, you know, an artificial arm or something like that wasn't cost effective. But now with 3D printing, you can do much more of that. You can create it just for their size and then rapidly create it again you know, in a couple of years. So the partnerships was very effective and, and helpful and is continuing to help with this effort with the 3D printing and I'm just part of the broader package of, of collaborating at NIH. With that, I'll take questions. Thank you.